Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the meeting of the Overview and Scrutiny Panel, Environment, Communities and Partnerships. So we'll just get on with the agenda. Have we got any apologies? Uh, yes, we have apologies from Councillor Criswell and Councillor Bywater. Thank you. So we'll move on to the minutes. Has, any, has everyone read the minutes? Has anyone got any issue with the minutes from last meeting? Just make a note, they were really good. Thank you, Becky, they were very thorough. So, has any members got a declaration of interest? No? All right, we can carry on with the notice of executive decisions. Has everyone had a read of the executive decisions and has anyone got any comments on them? Nope. No, I haven't either. Thank you. So, we'll now move on to item four, business rates, discretionary rate, rate relief policy. Thank you, Chair. Um, good evening, everybody. So this evening, we'd like to uh, like you to consider the business rates discretionary rate relief policy. Um, lots of you will have been district councillors for a lot longer than me, and you're probably aware that every single time a business shuts down in our town centres, uh, HDC gets the blame because HDC determines the rent, HDC determines the rate, determines the rates in in the public view anyway. Both those things are completely mm -hmm. false is rents are normally set by private landlords and the rates are set by central government. We do have a small lever, though, which we can influence that. So this discretionary rates relief policy is a mechanism by which we can, under uh, exceptional circumstances usually, grant uh, a degree of relief to businesses uh, and absorb some of those rates. Um, I think when we're considering this, it's important to consider that every time we do that, we're using money from the public purse quite often to subsidise small businesses and charities, which is often the right thing to do, but it's always should be a difficult decision. Um, this uh, policy is an evolution of the previous policy. There are no big changes, I don't think. But what it is, it presents a clear and consistent set of guidelines so that when we're making decisions about who should get rate relief and who shouldn't, um, it should be obvious and fair to everyone. Um, with that, I'm going to hand over to Zoe, who's going to talk you through some of the more uh, technical details. I think we're working. <laughs> okay, as Stephen has said, the uh, discretionary rate re relief policy is quite status quo, but there are a few uh, changes that are actually uh, included within there. Um, we have a rate relief valuation revaluation from the 1st of April 2023. So we have taken the opportunity to actually review the policy and ensure that it is actually fit and it, it actually reads quite well. Um, We've, we've gone through and looked at um, the, the, the main changes uh, I'll, I'll start with first is in terms of non-profit making organisations, we have actually amended the cap limit. So previously, in the previous policy, it was 25,000. We've now gone up to 51,000, which echoes the small business rate multiplier and ensures that more businesses would actually fall within that scope. But it also they would need to ensure that they actually meet the other sort of exceptional criteria and they actually meet all of the, uh, the other uh, policies that uh, were previously in there. We've actually added the Section 69 relief, some uh, more details in terms of the Section 69 uh, relief. Now, this is actually fully funded by HDC, so we've, we've gone through and, and given some, um, some guidance as to how we would, uh, we would look at um, sort of the localism relief there. That's... Uh, it, it's very similar to the reliefs that are given by our neighbouring authorities, uh, cap limits, etc. Um, and that has been uh, done and looked at uh, as well with economic development. 
we've put some specific detail in terms of appeals data so that we can be ensuring that we uh, if somebody is aggrieved by the decision that we actually have given that there is clear and concise details on what they can do next and, and what will happen in the event of, of any appeal. We have also um, looked um, and put some very sort of readable so it's, it, it reads particularly well for uh, for the users so obviously any questions. Sorry, sorry. One, one further point is that if you look on, on the website, this confused me for a little bit, you'll see a longer list of relief, um, rates relief that businesses can claim against. Many of those things, so there's a small business rates relief, there's an empty property rates relief, those are mandatory rates reliefs and not discretionary, and so those are applied by the government and not by us. So this is just discussing the element that we have control of. It's, it's literally discretionary as a discretion of HDC rather than a government-mandated uh, rates relief. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Ferguson. Has anyone got any questions or comments they'd like to make? Um, Councillor Olbein. Thank you, Chair. As a member representing a, a rural ward, particularly this week, having been at a, a meeting looking at the future of getting primary school and the knock-on effect that that might have on some of the, the, the businesses that are dependent on the wider impact of a school closure, I was quite particularly focused this, this week, as I say, on, on rural issues. But my concern thinking with a, a district-wide um, perspective is do the towns, do small organisations and small businesses in towns get as much of a fair go of, of, of this as, as, the, uh, as, as the rural parts of our district? If you could clarify that, I'd, I'd appreciate it. Thank you. So I'll, I'll let um, Zoe answer that question technically. But as you know, last time we were in front of this panel, we were discussing the rural rate relief policy and some of the hoops we jumped through to, to grant businesses that might not otherwise be eligible. So we split sometimes. We have split in the past parishes up to, to get them below the minimum population threshold so they would qualify for rural rate relief. Um, I think that, I don't know, Zoe will answer more uh, concisely than me, but I think uh, it's particular. I agree with you. It's particularly important in rural locations where there's only ever going to be maybe one pub or one uh, post office. I've got an issue in Great Gransden, who I represent a in county where the pub is shut down. It's causing lots of distress in the community. I think towns have more vibrant economies with more footfall and more potential, you know, more flux of businesses as well. So I think it's probably right, and we'll hear from Zoe if this is true, that we, we do give extra support to rural economies because like you say, if you live in a village, those places can be the social heart of villages, can't they? The post office and the pub. Um, and so it's important that we protect those facilities. So I, I would be in favour of protecting those. Let's hear from Zoe and she can tell us about maybe the levels of relief available. Thank you. Uh, yeah, in particular rural rate relief, that is actually covered. Um, it depends obviously on the defined settlement and the actual population of um, the rural settlement. It needs to be under 3,000. Um, it, it, the policy does actually specifically state which businesses are covered. It would be the only village shop, the only pub, post office. However, obviously if it is a retail business, there are other businesses that, uh, business rate reliefs that can apply, such as the retail, hospitality and leisure um, businesses up to a certain rateable value. Um, you've also got the small business rate relief scheme, um, which is under uh, the 15,000 uh, threshold for rateable value. Um, also, with the new rating list, if somebody actually falls foul of the um, with their rateable value, if somebody falls foul um, and their rateable value does ex exceed um, certain valuation limits, um, there is the new supporting small business rate scheme, which actually caps that limit at £600 also. So that it's not just one uh, rate relief policy there's a whole host of policies that can actually support lots of businesses within the area um councillor mccadden yeah um just one quick question um where do charity shops stand within this uh scheme uh, the charity shops if it's a registered charity with the charities commission that is a mandatory relief so that's not within the scope of this policy 
also one of the reasons why we see our, our, our town centres increased number of charity shops is because they're competing well not shops regular shops have to pay rates and charity shops do not which explains the proliferation sometimes of charity shops councillor orbain just on looking at 6.2 on on that point and the point that councillor mcadam made and it says that within the boundaries of legislation these policies will ensure support will be provided to charities community activity clubs and non-profit making companies and i think in the report i was reading there's a difference between a national charity with a chain of shops and a small independent local charity and i think that's probably maybe what we're looking to make ensure somewhere like the one down the the, the, the huntington community shop down the road gets a fair crack of, of any support and, and funding as much as some a, a national charity that might be rural based or more so in the, yeah, I think that's um, obviously it's, it's important to realise the, the sort of the definition between the ones that are registered charities and the non-profit making organisations. Obviously, I can't speak for specific um, cases. Uh, however, that's where the discretionary rate relief element for non-profit making organisations would come into play, um, and the rateable value limits that we've got, we would look at each case on a case by case basis, um, and where they are non-profit making, we would then look at obviously all of the details which are are in within the scope of the policy, and look at their their makeup as it were, and look at each each case on an individual basis and see what it is that they're actually offering and what benefit it is to the community. Has anyone got any other comments or questions to ask? Councillor Shaw. Thank you. Um, so am I right in saying that it stipulates in Section 3 there's a 100% cost to the council um, on any essentially businesses we award this relief to? Um, so presumably that directly affects HDC's income, is that right? Yes, so this is this is obviously a balancing act between supporting the local economy, which all of us want to do, I'm sure, and also maintaining our income stream. Um, the, the, the business rates team is extremely geeky and nerdy. I love them because they love spreadsheets uh, and they, they go through extensive modelling to make sure that whatever changes we make are not going to cost the council lots of money. And so chatting with Zoe this afternoon, I think this is intended to be cost neutral isn't it? So, so this is a slightly different policy, but it won't cost us any money because we have to use that money to support communities, to support businesses. And as always, I was thinking on driving here, there's a question about, you know, if we're going to offer rates relief to one business, we might save one business. But if we use that money as part of promotion campaign, which the previous administration did brilliantly, you know, promoting our market towns, we could, we could attract more people in and promote more businesses. So they're difficult decisions always. And I think the point of this paper is it's kind of giving a very clear set of guidelines through which you can make those decisions, so we're going to be consistent. But if people do fall through the trap, there's always the appeal process as well. And Zoe loves appeals, don't you, Zoe? <laughs> Can I just ask another related question? So, is there any? I couldn't see anything in the document that um, whereby this would sort of be a last resort. So, um, would we push nationally funded initiatives over locally funded funded initiatives? Um, I couldn't see, I mean, I saw in section three it mentioned uh, where no other relief is possible, um, but I didn't, I couldn't actually see it within the um, policy documents at all. Um, so, um, for example, if a, if a business said, I want to open up in Huntingdonshire and I'm going to employ 100 people, we want to apply for some relief, um, we could look at putting them, for example, on Alconbury, where they don't pay business rates relief that's funded centrally rather than us funding it. Does that make sense? Um, I'm not quite sure what you sort of get. In terms of this particular relief, this is it, it's a specific localism relief to, it, to encourage investment is sort of where we, we're looking at here. Um, it, there was some... Sort of suggestion that we may look at sort of green agendas and, and everything else with obviously the way that the council are looking and and that is something that we we would be looking at in the future you know attracting green businesses and everything else um but in terms of as we are at the moment we 
it, it is purely, uh, you know, something that people can apply for in terms of looking at, at business growth um, and attracting business. And it, it's just part of a package of incentivizing um, investment within the area. And as I say, it is a, as a maximum of 20,000 and it would be for the one year only. So it's, it's just part of a, a rate relief package. It's something that has always been there and it's something that we've always been able to give since 2011, but we are just putting a little bit more meat and bones, as it were, into the policy. Sorry. Uh, so, and I think we. I think in, there is a clear bias towards businesses who are benefit to the local community, but that doesn't necessarily have to mean they're local businesses as well. So, I think you know, national national chains that come here or small national trains would also be, you know, would through, through the same rules would be able to apply for funding. Any other comments or questions? And just for myself, I really enjoyed reading it. I thought it was very clear. I think it will encourage new businesses, and I'm quite excited to see if it will um, instigate more businesses. Can I also just thank Zoe for doing such a good job of making it actually a click? Because it's not, you know, it's not anybody's favourite topic, is it? But it's a really clear an easy to read uh, paper. I had a bit of a panic over the weekend after I think I didn't know it, but actually by reading the paper and talking to Zoe, I think it is a, a fantastic piece of work. So thank you very much. Yeah, I agree. Thank you, Zoe. Oh, one, and one more um, comment, Councillor Shaw. Regarding um, public conveniences, obviously the relief for that is um, purely a building that is just a public convenience. Is there any leeway on that, i.e. because there's not a lot of public toilets around here? And what I was thinking is, um, could a, a retailer, for example, get a proportionate discount on it? Does that make sense? It's working. <laughs> um, it has to be actually noted as a public convenience as it's in, in the rate rating list the actual um property has to be called i think it's public convenience and premises so i don't think off the top of my head i don't think we've actually got any um i may be proved wrong by one of the um, business rates team but i don't think we've actually got any thank you panel for your comments um so we're all in agreement that these comments be passed forward to the cabinet is, it, is everyone in agreement? Thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you for making a note, Becky. Thank you very much, Councillor Ferguson and Zoe. So we'll now move on to um, agenda item five, the One Leisure and Burgess Hall Progress Review. We've got, we've got a group now coming to give a presentation. <laughs> yes, thank you, <laughs> Councillor Taylor. Like, yes. Stand, yeah. if, if you could, if you could sit, so then you can use the microphones. That'd be great. Yeah. J just whilst they're getting seated, just let the councillors know. I have requested the heating be turned down. Yeah. Yeah. Would you like to offer your presentation? Thank you, Chair, and, and hello, councillors, officers, and members of the public that are watching virtually, hopefully. Um, right, tonight, and thank you very much for inviting us, and I, I, I pre-warn you, there is a lot of information here. So uh, I think there's about 33 slides, isn't there, or something like that. So um, don't worry if you're not going to take it all in, and you will... I guarantee you learn lots about One Leisure Active Lifestyle and the Burgess Hall tonight. Um, I have even learned more about it through looking at the presentation um, the other day. If um, there are questions, absolutely, you know, questions after the presentation, um, I know that I'm um, thank you for Councillor Ferguson and Zoe for. Um, 
not having it so long. So we've got a little bit of extra time. But um, we will be, um, if you have any other questions, we'll be able to, what we're thinking is actually take you around One Leisures. So we'll set up some meeting dates and times for you to come to the One Leisures, come and have a look around and can absolutely ask questions then as well. Or any other questions, you can email myself. And if I don't know the answer, I will find the answer out. So I'll thank you all in advance, Martin, Greg, Paul, and Joe. Thank you very much. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Simone. And, and um, just to start, um, I'll just reiterate what Simone has just said uh, in terms of welcoming your uh, subject to the presentation. If you have any questions, there is a lot of information and we would welcome you along to a, a future meeting to answer any other questions that you may not have um, this evening. So just first of all, I'd just like to go uh, through to the next slide, if that's possible, please, uh, the agenda slide. So I won't go through in too much detail. It's there in front of you. What we'd like to do is just set out the purpose of the presentation, moving in, and what I thought was useful to provide a bit of a background on One Leisure. Some of you may not know much about One Leisure, but we thought it would be useful just over the last um, eight to 10 years, just provide you um, the background on One Leisure. We also wanted to provide an update on the independent review that was done pre-COVID in 2019 on One Leisure and provide you with a progress update on that. Um, and then a general progress update on One Leisure um, f f following the, the pandemic and, and looking in now more towards the medium term financial, uh, medium term forward plan, sorry, including the business strategy and the built facility strategy and then more on the longer term planning for One Leisure as well. So if I could just go to the next slide, please. So again, the purpose of the presentation was to provide you um, an overview um, of, of, of the background of One Leisure. Um, the independent review, the key successes and the challenges that the leisure industry as a whole has faced pre-pandemic and post-pandemic. So you, you understand it's not just one leisure that have faced these challenges, but also communicate the key important messages to our medium term financial, uh, financial plan, but also our medium term operational plan, leading into the longer term uh, operating model of one leisure. Uh, next slide, please. So in terms of the background of One Leisure, the, the real start of One Leisure was around 2010 uh, with a significant uh, move away from traditional leisure services to, um, with the hope of, of a move forward to commercial sustainability. And moving into 2015, uh, between 2015 and, and 2019, that there was the completion of the capital investment that came in the previous years, uh, the independent review that I mentioned um, on the last slide but also the underpinning of the commercial sustainability following the capital investment, and also the rejoining of active lifestyles to the One Leisure uh, brand, because they had actually operated under another arm of, of, of the council. Moving into 2020 and 2022, I think you'll all agree that there was significant disruption around the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, the, the, the most significant challenge we had was the closure of the, the leisure centres, the restricted capacity, um, and the operating principles across the leisure centres. Um, and more so around the centre's reopening with that reduced capacity and obviously the commercial recovery of the leisure centres as a whole. And moving into 2023, the, the, really what I want you to take away is uh, that we needed a clear vision and purpose, which I'll come on to, which was identified as part of the independent review, um, the, the culmination of a new business strategy underpinned by commercial sustainability, also looking at the health and well-being of our residents and how we can engage with them and how we can welcome more people into our leisure centres, reviewing how we can be commercially sustainable with a medium term plan, which gives us the bridge into the longer term operating models of One Leisure. If I could just go on to the next slide, please. So I mentioned about the independent review. This was undertaken pre-pandemic in 2019. Um, it's, a, it's a very large document. <laughs> I won't share that with you, but there are, key, there are eight key themes within um, the review. The first one was around providing a clear um, a vision and purpose for One Leisure. And I'll come on as, a, as an update to some of these themes shortly. Um, also, the, the, the um, development and implementation of key performance indicators to monitor and manage our business and our operation to ensure a move towards commercial sustainability. Um, detailed processes to improve the customer journey around membership information. The development of a retention strategy. So we're very good at selling memberships, but it's about retaining our memberships and making sure that that underpins everything that we do within our service delivery. 
the production and development of a new um, marketing and communications plan, um, introduction of price increases, which obviously we've done, that was um, approved by this committee and launched on January the 1st, and then a review of the staffing structures um, to make sure that we look at the financial sustainability and obviously um, service delivery moving forward. So this side really sets out, um, on the left hand side you can see the key themes that I've just mentioned, and on the right hand side is essentially an up to date review of where we're at. Uh, along those themes. So the first one was purpose and vision. So we've developed and finalised a, a new business strategy which will be launched across the business from April 2023. Um, we will be just facilitating some meetings with our frontline staff so that we can make sure that we get um, really important feedback from them around their contact with customers to ensure that the document is up to date and relevant and has been communicated with them and we'll happily share that with you uh, moving forward. In terms of performance management KPIs, we're in the process of finalising and, and rolling out um, some manual key performance indicators for our new general managers to uh, monitor the business, the performance of the uh, service delivery um, and on ongoing performance. We're also looking to upgrade our the point of sale system, which will allow us to generate automated reports. So rather than general managers, um, uh, utilize their time on um, going through regular reports and, and then looking at the key actions. These automated reports will provide them better business information. Um, they will drop into their inboxes and they'll have more time to actually develop and deliver the actions. A retention strategy, this is about keeping members. Um, we are currently working with a consultant that have launched and developed uh, a new membership management system um, aiming to, to, to welcome back 1400 members health and fitness direct debit, debit members that we had pre-pandemic that we haven't got at the moment and they will um, work with us to develop that retention strategy that will be rolled out across every element of our business from frontline staff through to supervisory and management staff and I mentioned about the consultant that we brought in in terms of health and fitness we know that we've done a review and, and, and it will be, be part of our presentation that Paul will go through shortly uh, we, we lost 1400 members um, now versus the pandemic and we brought in a manual sales system and a consultant to support us to do that um, so we had a positive month last month we sold 589 um, direct debits which is fantastic news versus our target of 500 but again I won't steal Paul's thunder because I'm sure he'll cover that in the presentation later on price increases we developed and implemented that on the 1st of January and then staffing uh, structures and reviews one was facilitated prior to and during COVID um, and we intend to review our staffing structures between April and June um, to ensure that um, we can manage our service delivery but also the financial sustainability of One Leisure. I'll now pass over to Paul France, Business Operations Manager for One Leisure Facilities just to take you through the next few slides. Thank you. Thank you Greg and good evening everybody. Um, as Greg said, um, the next few slides are going to talk about um, what One Leisure in general uh, and what we do and what we provide. One Leisure is not just about the uh, the five leisure centres listed in the in the second bullet point there. Um, it's important to note that lots of great work also goes on in and around the, the communities of the district um, throughout through the Active Lifestyles team, and you'll hear a little bit more about that in detail. Um, the key objectives of all One Leisure staff, be it in the facilities or out in the community, is to make the people of Huntingdonshire more active more often and therefore more healthy either in or out of the facilities so as a team you know it's not just about what happens in the leisure centres it's about what happens out in the community as well uh, next slide please this is just uh, a brief overview going back to the facilities now which is generally my remit um, of the um, individual areas activity areas of the five major sites um, obviously situated in the, the key market towns, Huntington, Ramsey, St. Ives and St. Neots. For those of you that don't know, in St. Ives, um, there's an indoor and an outdoor centre, so an outdoor complex which, which focuses on, on outdoor activities. There's lots of different activities that take place in these distinct areas um, by members of the public, but also by clubs and organisations that make use of the facilities. And of course, the Burgess Hall, um, the conference and events centre, delivers a multitude of, of arts, entertainments, music activities uh, to cater for a wide range of tastes across the district. So it really does cover a wide spectrum uh, of not just sports and leisure activities, but arts and entertainments as well. Um, 
and if we go on to the next slide, and I'll hand over to Martin, please. Uh, yep, yeah. uh, Martin Gray, Sports Development Manager uh, in the Active Lifestyles team. So this is just a little bit about what we do, Active Lifestyles, in terms of uh, our team. We've got a sm quite a small team um, that do a number of different things across the district. Um, we split it in sort of three different strands in terms of delivery, strategic, and our development side. So you might see lots that happens, and um, if you follow our social media pages, you'll see quite a lot in terms of our delivery. We're out there doing quite a lot of different programs, working with lots of different target groups, um, trying to get people into the leisure centres, but also supporting people out in the, in the rural communities that we know we've got across our district. So that might be specialist exercise classes, young people's ho holiday activities, uh, walking sports programs, various different various different things that we do. Um, Another side of our role that people don't see as much is some of the strategic work that we do. So we do a lot of work around um, planning consultations, looking at the active environments, so how we can support residents to be active in their environments with all the growth we've got in, in Huntingtonshire. So that's one of the strategic parts that we do. Um, and then we also do a lot of de development work. So we do a lot of work supporting clubs or working across sort of different partners, community groups, obviously supporting them to support some of their groups to be active and healthy. Uh, next slide, please. Back to Paul. Thank you. So um, we're just going to go through um, a few of the the, the successes of uh, the, the leisure centres in in the more recent uh, past, uh, and we split them up into into two areas. Um, one um, being significantly, as Greg pointed out earlier, we we had a a lot of capital investment here, here previously to. Um, aim to uh, make the centres commercially um, sustainable um, and, and successfully so. And you can see a, a list of um, items there that, that have been supported by the local authority through through capital investment. Um, just picking out one or two of them, um, I know that um, the, the current administration are, were really keen to see the Ramsey decarbonisation scheme completed in 2022. Um, so, so that facility now, um, it was Salex, uh, Salex and Decarb funded 100%, that one, so not, not capital investment on that, um, all externally funded. Um, so Ramsey as a site, no, no gas um, use or, or anything like that now. Um, the, uh, we've had a, a little bit of a, a move around of all the sites around the swimming pools. Swimming pools are, are, are quite um, older, the older buildings. They, they, sort of, they were built in the, the, the 70s mainly and early 80s. So um, particularly the changing rooms um, take a lot of, um, uh, of wear and tear. So we had a program around that in 2018, 19 and into 2020. Um, and all of those sort of developments maintain um, customer um, use uh, and, and throughput particularly. Prior to, to that, it's not on here, but we did uh, complete a, a refurbishment at Huntingdon um, uh, in 2018 around the gym. We, we did a lot of commercial investment, um, as Greg said, through 2010 to 2015, um, which was mainly focused at St. Neots and, and St. Ives. So the Huntingdon refurb in 2018 was really the culmination of, of that in terms of productive um, commercial areas. Um, and then uh, one or two sort of smaller areas, um, Cyclone indoor at cycling experience is one that um, we sort of looked at the demographic of the area. A lot of uh, cyclists in and around um, Huntingdonshire, Cambridgeshire uh, and stuff. So we targeted that as a, as a specific activity, knowing what our um, target audience was, was all about. In terms of service delivery, I've just picked a few highlights there. You know, the leisure centres um, continue to, to deliver um, to the local residents year on year. Um, We'll hear about the, the financial um, um, successes of, of the, the centres um, a little bit later, but um, One Leisure Ramsey um, achieved, was the, achieved its first surplus position in 2017-18, which for a facility of that size nationally um, it was, is well recognised because you, you don't generally get that in smaller community centres. Um, a little bit of a national recognition there, St Ives Outdoor Centre hosted a national touch rugby final um, competition. Um, which was attended by all from uh, clubs all over the country. Um, you can see that I've tried to pick the, the different centres. St Ives and St Neots were in the top five of the APSI national benchmarking um, delivery. So that covers lots of different benchmarking across both financial and service deliveries. Um, uh, and in 2019, they were rated in the top five uh, of their family group. 
um, funded swimming lessons for, for hundreds of pupils uh, who, who don't who didn't achieve the national curriculum. So again, trying to show there that it's not just all about sort of bringing money in, but it's a lot about the health and well-being of the community as well. And then the last one, um, really important, um, the person the person who was involved in both of these medical interventions was recognised recently through the uh, Council Eye Care Awards. But um, you know, um, really heavily involved in, in making sure that our facilities are safe um, for for our. Um, residents and, and two people um, successful medical interventions to to um, to save their lives so it's so really important for us as well I think then if we move on to the next slide I think is that uh, Martin again please okay so yeah so just picking on some of the successes of active lifestyles um, we've got quite a lot of things we we are proud about as a, as a team um, when you look in delivery part of our function um, we're quite lucky across Hunters and Shear about the classes that we deliver in terms of specialist health conditions, uh, linking into cancer, pulmonary, cardiac rehab. We have a number of highly skilled staff that have to go through various different training programs to be able to deliver those. And obviously that's a good link with, with the NHS and the system of people coming out and coming into rehab. Strategically, um, again, a concessionary membership scheme is, is a highlight there that we've offered uh, over the last few years to ensure that people on lower incomes receiving benefits can also access the leisure centres. And as you'll see, membership is, is increasing in, in that area. So that's a, another strategic part that we're, we're very proud of. Um, and then across our development role, there's a number of programmes and, and links into partners in terms of development, but you'll see there we've We've offered an adaptive bike scheme at Hinchbrook Country Park. We've got external funding to support that. Um, so that links into a number of different developments that we've, we've, again, we're proud of. So next slide, please. So this is just specifically about some of the, the grants that we've secured. And again, it's something that um, in terms of the Active Lifestyles team, what we do and what we deliver. Um, we bring in significant amount of money into the district through various different ways in terms of capital and, and revenue funding. Um, so we can link in with some of the stuff that Paul's talked about. We support with, with capital grants, helping the leisure centres. So recently building the 3G pitch at One Leisure Ramsey, where we got £460,000 from the Football Foundation um, is a significant amount of money we're bringing into the district. But also we get revenue grants and you can see across the different years of, of how that split out but that can support our delivery programs, can offer specific programs so that people can have better access into um, delivery arms of what the Active Lifestyles team is doing. So there's various different um, grants that we've secured over the years. Uh, next slide, please. So I think this slide really summarizes uh, the key challenges that One Leisure and the wider leisure industry have faced. The, the main challenge that we faced over the last couple of years is obviously COVID around the recovery in attendances and the new fitness trends. There's generally been a societal change uh, in customer behaviour uh, where more people are exercising outside and, and taking different um, decisions in how they uh, keep fit and active. The recent utility cost increases, um, obviously ours have, have gone up significantly as we outlined within the recent price and increase report. Uh, increased competition in the local area. We know that there's a, a pure gym opening up in St. Ives um, imminently. We know that um, we also have Anytime Fitness uh, in Huntington and obviously the gym group that opened recently over the last 12 to 18 months in Hunting Huntington as well. So when we compare pre-pandemic to post-pandemic, we're, we're not really comparing apples with apples because there is increased competition and, and, and it's, it's very difficult. It's a very difficult environment to work within in terms of uh, moving through um, commercial sustainability. Um, in terms of commercial sustainability, that is our main um, element of, of recovery, looking at uh, our uh, business performance to ensure that there is no cost to Huntingtonshire District Council through the, the, the facilities and, and active lifestyles. One key point really is the health and wellbeing um, agenda, identifying and engaging as Martin and, and Joe, I'm sure will update you on shortly, um, how we um, provide that short term focus and then obviously the longer term planning. Digital innovation is the second point uh, other than health and wellbeing that U uh, UK Active have identified with, with Sport England and APSI, the two things that really need to drive the leisure industry forward and how we align with health and wellbeing, but also how we use technology to advance the leisure and the service delivery um, across um, our facilities. 
and also staff. There, for example, there's a, a national shortage of swim teachers. We know there's a nationally a shortage of about 8,000 swim teachers. So we've made um, really significant process uh, progress. Sorry in our um, swim school where we've de developed it from 2,700 to about 3,200 as of today. We've grown, that's a growth of 500 over the last sort of nine months, which is fantastic. We know there's a, a, a waiting list, but, but the thing that's holding us back is the recruitment of teachers. What we've done to, to, to try and um, mediate that is we've reviewed the pay scales of our swimming teachers and we're just about to launch an increase to a market supplement to their hourly pay for level one and level two swimming teachers so we can compete with our competitors um, because we, we, we significantly had a problem whereby we were recruiting swimming teachers but they were going elsewhere who, who offered higher rates. So that's to try and combat, retain, recruit and develop our swimming school from a commercial point of view. And, and wide, wider afield, obviously attracting the right calibre of staff to develop and, and retain them moving forward to deliver the service. I'll move on to the next slide, please. Back to you, Paul. Thank you, Greg. So, so we've heard about um, you know what what One Leisure is is all about. Um, just snippet, really. There's still lots lots of that there. And, and um, Greg and Councillor Taylor have obviously invited you to to come and, and have a look around. But um, what we're going to move on to now is um, a little bit more of the progress review and and, and what we're seeing um, across. Um, we'll, we'll focus on sort of the the, the more recent past. Although um, I think with the budget we go back a little bit further to, to be able to give you um, a bit more of a, a bigger picture. But this um, this graph, in summary, hopefully you can read the yeah the, the bullets don't come up too bad underneath. Um, it really shows the dramatic effect. This this is this is attendances. Um, um, uh, so people that are coming through the door, it doesn't include schools. Um, so schools, you can add another well, somewhere between four hundred to five hundred thousand uh, admissions as well for schools. But these are paying um, admissions. And you can see the dramatic effect of, of the COVID pandemic. Um, prior to COVID 2021 there, um, the, the admissions were very stable um, at just under 1.8 million um, visits a, a, a year. Um, the, the closures of the, the, there's a bullet point in there that says, you, you know, the, the thing that you'll note is that those three years, uh, whilst the admissions were stable, the, the targets weren't quite met. Um, some of you may remember and may have been about um, to, to know that um, things, uh, issues in, in terms of lease negotiations and stuff like that um, slowed down um, the capital investments that I've already talked about. So the closures of the synthetic pitches in St. Neots and the swimming pool changing room developments were significant refurbishments um, prior to COVID, which, which just slightly affected um, those um, meeting the target. More, more encouragingly, though, as you can see, is the recovery since reopening in 21-22. In um, the admission targets are, are, are lower, but they've been set based on the facilities that reopened. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about that on a further slide. And the industry modelling of, of expected customer behaviour. Um, so, uh, as you can see, last year, attendance has exceeded those targets. Um, and with a couple of months to go this year, the forecast is for is that we will have increased again and still continue to be ahead of the recovery target on on those attendances. Uh, next slide, please. You'll notice that um, when I talked about the, the facilities, um, sort of briefed over a little bit in terms of the, the specific activities that are in there. One of the reasons for that is that we now go into a, a couple of slides which really touch on the, the key uh, activities that we deliver in in the sites. And the first one being um, fitness, um, and, and this centers mainly around gym visits, but also um, uh, fitness classes, some um, swimming pool activity, aqua fit. Um, and this actual graph shows a, a little bit of a, a trend in terms of members paying a direct debit for the use of, of the um, fitness facilities. So this is a, 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 um, a running um, total of fitness DD members on a monthly basis. And you can see that um, the graph reflects the impact of, of COVID with a very stable base pre-pandemic, um, just under the, the 7,000 mark, um, that fell by around 2,000 members on, on reopening. Uh, as Greg said, we're, we're now at that uh, around about 1,400 members light. So we have you know, already grown that back. Um, and it was predicted, uh, mainly due to either a reluctance to return to the facilities due to the nature and media coverage of the pandemic, um, but also over the 12 months where people 
Um, we're, we're not visiting the facilities. Many members change their exercise habits to, to outdoor pastimes and um, bought um, what are they, the Peloton bikes and, and stuff um, so that you see on the television. But uh, a significant survey by, by UK Active, the, uh, the industry body um, of gym users, suggested a recovery curve. And up until the, um, the autumn of 2022, One Leisure was consistently a couple of percent above that trajectory. Um, what the industry couldn't predict then, towards the back end of 2022, was cost of living effect. So over the last three to four months, we, we saw the back end of last year a bit of a slowdown, which you'll, you'll see reflected there in the, in the graph a little bit. Um, and it was national as well. Um, but we've seen, and Greg did steal the thunder, so I, I won't repeat the numbers again, but we've seen an upward trajectory already in, the, in January. And the new, new sales and membership process has already exceeded those stretch targets that Greg mentioned um, with more joiners than, than the same time last year. So, so things are, are looking, looking up. Next slide, please. Uh, this next one then focuses on um, swimming as, as the other key activity that, that we deliver. Uh, lots of activities in the facilities, but, but fitness and, and swimming being the two core ones. You may re remember from the COVID recovery um, presentations. And swim school continues to be a success. Um, to be fair, mainly due to the four sites with pools being the, the main source of swimming lessons in the district. Some of you will be aware of, of other pockets of smaller pools, but they've got limited capacity. So, so One Leisure is in a prime position for, to deliver this activity. Um, recovery from COVID, again, Greg's already talked about the numbers exceeding the, the, the previous levels of pupils that we had on swim schools, um, particularly when you factor in the removal of, of, of sortry from um, pre-pandemic. And the challenge now is to maintain that progression of children. So it's about retention as well in this as well as fitness, um, utilizing waiting lists effic efficiently and then tweaking programs. Greg talked about the, the longer term process so looking at how we can maximize our, our programs to, uh, to, to use that pool space effectively. Um, but Swim School is a, is a, is a definite success. Uh, next slide, please. I think I've got two more here. Um, moving on quickly uh, in terms of Burgess Hall. As I said, we're going back a little bit further with the Burgess Hall on this because we, we felt we would wanted to identify the peak um, performing years that saw significant income streams back in 15, 16. Um, but that was due to a much larger delivery team um, and associated marketing with, with therefore associated uh, expenditure. So you can see there the income and expenditure and therefore the net um, profit and loss. Obviously, account, HTC accounting minus figure is a, is a surplus. So um, all the way through there up to pandemic, you can see the Burgess Hall delivered a, a, a surplus, although um, the, the disruption to that management team prior to the pandemic um, the figures hovered around the, the £150,000 per annum mark as a surplus. And those management changes were, unfortunately, at that time, regular. And the industry does rely heavily on, on working relationships between venues, promoters, artists, and agents. So you need to, to, to create that, um, that rapport, hence the, the disruption. Um, since reopening the, this element, um, the, this area, the entertainment area of the leisure industry, has been the hardest hit, uh, undoubtedly. And therefore, the operating model that, that we've um, um, moved into, supported by um, the previous and current administration, has been controlled to, to deliver financially low-risk activities in the Burgess Hall through a recovery phase. It's proven successful. You can see there we moved uh, back in 21-22 in to, a, to a surplus position, albeit you know, more modest. Um, but we're moving up, and you can see the projection there. Um, back to the to a level of the, the 2019-20 um, already um, on that l less risk um, risky model, um, and we're continuing now to look to develop the program, um, looking at what our management and marketing resource will 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 need to look like to support this, with a move back to higher income levels, but still trying to maintain the expenditure um, in that controlled manner. And it, a manner. And if we move on to the final, my final sort of slide in this progress area, all, all this really does, um, and I'll let you sort of have a review of, of this because this is a little bit of a, a sneak preview of the, the um, strategy that Greg um, has re referenced a couple of times. This is a section around the Burgess Hall specifically, and this slide identifies the plans to achieve the figures and the model that I've just outlined with the, those where the successes are going to be driven from in terms of um, numbers and an appointment of key staff um, and, and things. So, so this is the type of thing that you'll see in the um, strategy when, when that's launched. 
Um, and that's the that's um, a review from the facilities point of view. So I think I'm going to now hand over to um, is it is it yourself, Joe? So Joe P. Then we'll take over. Thank you, Paul. Uh, thank you, everybody. Finally, my turn. I won't keep you long. Um, so this is um, a little bit of an update on the progress review of active lifestyles. So on the top um, left hand side, you'll see the um, graph shows the attendances from different years of the active lifestyles team. In 1920, we were heading for our best ever year um, from a combination of different things. And then, of course, COVID hit in, 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 the, uh, in that year, so it, it dropped off. But you'll see on the light blue line, hopefully, that actually we've been catching up this year rapidly. And we're, we're, um, we're, we've had a really good January as well, which obviously isn't on there as yet. Um, but it shows that performance in terms of getting people through the doors ha is getting back to where, where we were pre-COVID, pre um, which has been challenging because some of our groups, um, for instance, uh, the pulmonary maintenance class, they're referred from health services to us once they finish their health programme and their health programme often aren't back to face-to-face -to -face services yet. So if they're not back to face-to-face -face services, they're hardly likely to send people to us who are doing a face-to-face -face service. So, But other things have been really successful and have come back really well. So overall, we're really pleased. We just still have a few challenges. You'll see some of the new sessions there that we've, that we've been doing. I've got plans to start this quarter. More custom for health courses, more beginners Pilates, uh, indoor cycling and escape. So, and the bottom graph shows the number of sessions that we deliver to get people to those sessions. And again, we're not quite where we were before COVID, but actually that, that's not a bad thing because we actually want more people for less sessions with a higher average attendance. Because sometimes you're putting on sessions when you have grant funding that basically people don't come to, but you've got to put them on because you've got the grant funding. So it's, it, we don't necessarily need to be at the same level of sessions to get the same number of people being active. Does that, I hope that makes sense. Um, and again, year on year, things can change because of the funding. So you might get a grant that says, you've got to do this in 17, 18, and you put on X sessions, but you don't have that in 21, 22. So it's, again, it's like this apples and pears combination. Um, next slide, please. So, uh, yeah, so this, this graph um, shows the actual income recovery, but this is what we kind of term our controllable income. So it's literally um, our course fees and sales and activities that we get commissioned for by um, external partners. For instance, um, Huntington Church Community Cancer Network currently commission us to deliver to cancer maintenance to cancer rehab classes per week. So that it's that income. It doesn't include grant income. Um, and I think you can again. You can see the chart is 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 good that shows actually the orange line, which is which is this year is we've had our best year ever um, in terms of both cost fees and and cost recovered commission fees. So um, we're really pleased with with that progress. Um, yeah. Next slide, please. Um, and then moving on to. 2023-24, um, we have a new partnership with West Cam's Federation and Hunt's Primary Care Network who are using some of the facilities at One Leisure St Ives for some of their staff to carry out appointments. So that we're, that's a relationship that we're developing. You'll see a big health um, trend in amongst, theme in amongst all the, a lot of these things. And that's because we see that as, as a big growth area and working with all the new social prescribing link workers and health and wellbeing coaches that are employed through the primary care networks. We're working very closely with all of them to make sure they're aware of what's available through active lifestyles, but also one leisure. Um, but we help, we try to give that sort of helping hand and that sort of like introduction to things that they can then move on and do, do other stuff once they've finished with us or if they feel confident to. Um, I think that's yeah, I think that's about it for me. Thank you. Um, next slide, please. Uh, over to to me. A couple of slides now. And back to the back to the facilities now. Focusing specifically on 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 revenue, and the pattern on this graph should uh, be becoming particularly familiar now. Um, it does all link. 
Uh, the fo this focus is based on all income streams now, not just the, the, the fitness and swimming that we looked at before. So sports halls, outdoor pitches, um, uh, hospitality where, where the, we, we're open. Um, and you can see again the, 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 the fairly stable nature of, of our income streams pre-pandemic um, sat around um, 6.5 million pounds, um, you know, a significant amount of money. But 2021, um, 21, 22, obviously um, very heavily affected by COVID as per the other graphs on attendance um, and members. Um, the important bit here is that obviously we received that government funding during that, that, that period of time. So, so whilst you know, we, we were not open, we were still getting um, revenue in, a little bit like Joe's talked about in terms of her grants uh, and, and such. Um, but the most important uh, area of note here is the uh, increase in growth, the, the, the um, um, constant growth for in the last 18 to 24 months, which we've discussed previously when we're looking at the fitness and the swimming activities on, on that recovery, um, which are leading the way in that. But, um, you know, as I said, sports hall usage, usage, hospitality, outdoor pitches, they all form part of this as well. Um, we're still sat a little bit underneath the, the the six million is our forecast for the end of the year with a couple of months to go. Um, you know that's still a little bit shorter of where we were. MTFS projections in future years look to continue that growth back to pre-pandemic levels, and we're very confident of of reaching those um, with the membership um, um, plans that we have in place that that Greg's mentioned. Um, and it's also important to note that that's, you know there are still one or two areas that, that aren't open um, that contribute to that. So, for instance, the, the pure spas and, and, and stuff don't generate loads of money, but, but enough. However, you know, there is a saving there on, on the costs that, that um, you know, those activities, um, um, what's the word, um, you know, delivery of, of utility costs and stuff to, to actually put those activities on. And I think if we move on to the next slide, oh, we're staying on, sorry, we're staying on revenue. We've uh, I moved the slides around a little bit. Um, yeah, it's a little bit of a uh, hawky corky over here, isn't it? Yep. Um, yeah, so this is basically the active lifestyles revenue over the same period. And this actually does include the grant awards that we um, have, the revenue grant awards that we have been given and a one-off um, grant in 2018-19, which was related to St. Neots Football Club 3G pitch, which is a um, asset that we own as a, as a district council. Um, I think basically, again, we're just trying to say that actually we are recovering and we are getting back quite quickly. Well, in fact, we're going to surpass this year our best ever revenue in total. In, in total. Um, and well, just one thing I wanted to pick out, which isn't on the notes, but con the concessionary membership scheme, you'll all be aware of that. We've now actually got over 700 people signed up to that. Pre the, pre before the scheme was introduced, those people were spending about £2,500 in the ledger centres over the, over the year. In 1920, with, when we introduced the scheme, that increased to over 4000 and this year we're already over 8000 um, in terms of those people so they can they're coming more because they can afford it but they're actually spending more so it's for me it's a win-win in in total basically so that's one of the ways that we're helping to help the people of the of the district but also improve our financial position from that as well so but and the prices are very cheap so we're not overcharging so that was just okay Uh, thanks, Joe. Uh, and we're, we've moved on again. This was a slide that I was expecting. This is the expenditure, the, the opposite side uh, of, of the, the financial picture. But no real surprise here that the expenditure pattern of the facilities shows the, the same as income and, and attendances. Very stable pre-pandemic, a drop-off during the pandemic, and then a growth. The real difference, um, and, and it's difficult to see without putting them together, and we do have a slide that, that does that, is the speed of the increase in the last two years here. Um, there, it's accelerating back to the previous levels probably quicker than the income is slightly and and that's you know really easy to to identify it, it was a, in, initially affected by the minimum minimum wage increases so so the salary side of it salaries of of um you know a, a leisure provision it, always somewhere between 50 to 60 percent of the the costs um in in terms of delivery it's a service delivery but then more recently obviously this year with the energy price rises as well so they've really hit us quite hard and and those those costs 
but we, we are mitigating those increases wherever we, we can. It's been challenging, and, and Greg's going to talk about that in terms of challenges moving forward. Um, but, you know, um, spend is always being looked at under the microscope to see where we can, can make those savings while still delivering a, a, an exceptional service. Uh, and I think I'm back to, to Joe with one last time on expenditure. Thanks, Paul. Um, yes, yeah, so again, same slide for um, expenditure for active lifestyles. Uh, you'll see that basically it's fairly stable across each of the years. 18-19 is different because that is relating to the payment that was made for the St. Neitz Town Football Club 3 GPH, as I mentioned. It's all to do with how district council does their accounts. I still don't understand it, but it actually comes out of reserves, but it shows in our accounts. So, uh, yeah. So we didn't we didn't go mad in eighteen nineteen. I think is is the main thing. Our main expenditure is staffing because obviously that's what that's what we're doing. We're delivering activities. We're getting people active. We're um, helping people, and everything else, supplies and services, is around eight to ten k a year. Buildings about eleven k a year. Room hire, and that's about it really. We don't spend any other money. So um, that's that's where we're at on expenditure. Unless we, unless we get a grant, that means we have to spend something and buy some nice shiny equipment. Thanks, Joe. Um, so if I could, oh, you're already on it. Thank you. So this is um, a, a slide that summarises the profit and loss position um, of One Leisure. So um, again, I won't go through the, the exact detail, but you can see that the the deficit, the financial loss to uh, the council from, from One Leisure Services was fairly stable um, between 1718 um, and 1920. That obviously increased into 2020 to 2021 and 21 22 and because of the utility increases and the, and the um increases in national minimum wage um in 22 23 we're expecting that to uh, be in the region of um, 730,000 pounds um in terms of 23 24 we've mitigated that with improved um or planned growth in um, swimming uh in um, outdoor pitches um through um, fitness activities, membership income, and, and swim school, um, and, and what we've what we're actually planning is a, a financial um, deficit of three hundred fifty-two thousand uh, pounds for twenty-three twenty-four. Um, and, and in terms of making that commercially sustainable, we've got a plan. If we can move on to the next slide, um, that I can just take you through with some key elements. So, as I've stated, the financial position for twenty-three twenty-four is a, a deficit of three hundred fifty-two thousand pounds. And part of our mitigation and our forward plan uh, was around um, introducing the price increase, which we'd calculated about £194,000. What I've tried to do simply here on this table is in the top right hand corner of the box, you can see the financial position of 2023-24 and the impact that the revenue generation through the price increase will have on the bottom line. There are a number of other elements within this table that we believe if we take these as actions through the year 23-24, we will we will get to a break even if not a, sh a small um, a financial contribution to the council um, and our aim is to do that through 23 24 some of these items obviously are commercially sensitive um, uh, so i won't go into too much detail now but as as um, councillor taylor alluded to um, we would welcome you to a, a separate meeting and i'm happy to go into more detail on some of those if there are questions that you'd like to raise but it just sets out the journey that we're on from a medium term um, plan to get to a break-even or commercially sustainable position. If I can go on to the next slide. So we're moving to the end of the presentation now. Um, and what, what I really wanted to showcase here was the, the five key strategic themes um, of our new business strategy. Um, so it is well known uh, within the leisure industry, particularly with UK Active, the trade industry body, Sport England, that um, the, the key drivers now for change in leisure are, are through digital innovation and how we use and modernise technology to improve service delivery, uh, but also efficiencies within our service, but also more so how we engage with our local communities and provide um, good health and wellbeing facilities for them. But we want to centre it around our people, so our staff engagement, our staff morale, motivation, reward and recognition, um, service modernisation, which links into digital innovation, new websites, um, and, and more uh, technological advances within our facilities, uh, and widening that community provision and, in, and, and underlying that, the, the commercial sustainability um, that I think we're all striving for within our facilities. If I can just pass over to Martin. Yeah, next slide, please. 
So yeah, so a key part of the the medium term plan moving forward is um, last year we appointed some consultants, KKP, to deliver the new facility strategies. This is around our built facility um, infrastructure and also the playing pitch strategy. So that's around the landscape around pitches, tennis courts, etc. So this is a, a key document that will support the local plan and the new upcoming local plan. Um, it's endorsed by Sport England. It's consultation with lots of national governing bodies of sport. It's basically overlooking the, the landscape, what we currently have across the district in terms of swimming pools, for example, and with the future growth, what we potentially are going to need. Um, so the strategies will support a number of different functions, but it will make strategic recommendations for that future need. Um, with the strategies in place and endorsed, we'll hopefully be able to bring in additional funding, as we've talked about, as we showed earlier on about the funding that we've brought in over a number of years. These new strategies will allow us to apply for other external funding, will support obviously the SEAL program and will support Section 106 around the developments and growth. Um, so as we said there, we're coming up to sort of like the final copies coming up. And once we've uh, finalised that with the consultants, it will be coming back through uh, ONS and through Cabinet for, for sign off. So there'll be more for, to come from that. Uh, next slide, please. Thanks, Martin. So this slide summarises the um, the key components of um, the original um, head of leisure, interim head of leisure role, um, which was around the um, the leading of the service, um, the specialist gyms and active lifestyles programmes, ensuring and, and importantly making sure that um, one one leisure were commercially sustainable, improving the customer experiences, but importantly also identifying and recommending um, what the future direction of one leisure um, would look like. Um, and in terms of that, looking at the operating models that are out there within the leisure environment um, and, and obviously overseeing that and the transition of any new long term operating models that, that um, are presented and approved by the council um, and overseeing the implementation of those long term models. Moving on to the next slide. This was just some uh, key um, commonalities um, in terms of what could be included in terms of long-term operating models, such as the alignment to HDC properties, thought processes around being a staff-led organisation, business sustainability, a commercial vision, a vision and approach, which I think you'll agree is very important, um, making sure that we can operate independently, but also fundamentally being a market leader both locally and nationally um, for sport, leisure and recreation provision across the community um, to ensure that we can support the local communities. Um, and, and the final slide really, and the, the, the key slide that I'd like you all to take away in terms of um, One Leisure, um, and I thought it was worthwhile trying to succinctly um, summarise the presentation, but also where One Leisure really are, are at and where we need to move to. Um, looking at the independent review, um, the independent review and actions are either complete or underway, as you've seen. Importantly, uh, the recovery of One Leisure is near completion post-COVID, which is fantastic. The implementation of a new management system to improve health and fitness prepaid memberships, that's, that's been implemented. All of our staff have been trained in December. That was implemented from January the 1st. We've had um, very few comments back um, around um, the implementation of a price increase, but like Paul alluded to, we sold over 580 memberships in January versus a target of 500. We know that growth year on year from January 22 to January 23 has moved on forward by 560 memberships. Our, our break-even point is 1,000 members. Our target is 1,400, which is pre-pandemic levels. So we are on the right trajectory. That is with increased competition, but it's also with a new membership management system in place, which our staff have been trained on, and we're also performing very well at the start of this month, which is which is really important uh, to note. Uh, the next one is um, a, a review and implementation of a new hybrid hybrid business model for Burgess Hall. Paul alluded to that. That was also looking at how we operate at the moment, which is a less risk based model. Um, and also looking at how we can infill the gaps within the program, utilising what we used to do and how we used to manage um, and, and taking some uh, some more um, balanced risk um, opportunities to bring in new acts and new entertainment for the local communities to develop the business and move it forward from a commercially sustainable point of view. Importantly, I've outlined the medium term forward plan to you, including the actions that we'd like to take during 23 and 24 to make us break even or no cost uh, or, or, or even provide a, 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 a small surplus to, to, to the local authority. Um, and lastly, 
we're adopting and finalising and implementing a new business strategy for 23-24, um, which will be launched from April the 1st. And those both the medium term plan and the business strategy for 23-24 are really the bridging um, bridging um, strategies to, to move through to the longer term plan. And those longer term options will be presented back to um, overview and scrutiny committee and full cabinet um, in, in six to 12 months time once we've um, gone out to market and reviewed the operating models that, that are out there, um, which will be presented back. Um, that's the end of the presentation. Welcome questions. Thank you. Um, have you got any questions or comments? Thank you. Um, I just wanted to say thank you to you guys because that was a really useful insight into the wider work done by Active Lifestyles. I, I had what I thought was a good knowledge of it from, from meeting with you uh, last year. Um, I just wanted to ask um, around opportunities, and, and I know you, you sort of talked about the primary care networks and obviously how that is now becoming the integrated um, care service. So I just wanted to know a little bit more about what opportunities you've got or whether there are opportunities around some additional external funding um, and how that will then impact and, and expand um, and working kind of with health colleagues and things. Um, and also that there's a lot of work around people that are coming out of hospital, just whether that what work is being done preventatively with with our health colleagues to try and avoid people going into hospital in the first place. Okay, sorry, it's on now. Um, so there's an awful lot of work going on. I think is 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 the answer to that. It starts with Ollie at the top and him banging on doors and Joe as well banging on doors um, at the very top of the integrated care system. Um, but it goes right right through the organisation. So just as a couple of examples, we're, I'm actually in discussions now with St. Neots Primary Care Network, which is all the GP surgeries in St. Neots apart from Alban Road Surgery, which is in a different primary care network. And they are going to commission us with some new money to deliver some programs for people with um, who are obese in St. Neots for their patients. So that's a new source of funding that we're going to be getting to deliver patient activity for them. It should have started in January. As, any, as ever, when you work with new partners, these things always take a bit longer to get um, going than they should. But we're ready to go. We're, we're, that's that's um, that's that's up and running. Um, we also have um, so we have regular meetings with um, the integrated care neighbourhood um, staff, so the program managers, and also we are in regular contact with social prescribers and um, the health and wellbeing coaches. Um, as a, a, my team, as a, on a sort of daily basis, really, we would um, opportunities are coming up every day. As a in a more strategic role, I'm also part of a um, waiting well partnership, which is um, a strategic group, including director of plan care for for um, the ICS uh, that represents the whole of um, the. Uh, system in Cambridgeshire, the ICS in Cambridgeshire, but I'm also on part of the Frailty Steering Group, which is actually a North Place part of the ICS, which is just co covers the north of the district, north of the county and not the south of the county. So it is very, it is very com complex, I think is what I'm, what I'm trying to say. And there's lots of different um, strands and, and what have you. Uh, but uh, again, this week, a colleague of mine has been talking to um, the social prescribers and um, the Parks Partnership around some money for green prescribing, green social prescribing in Yaxley, um, that's available ten thousand um, pound, and also um, I've be, I'll be last week I was talking to the integrated program manager for this area about some green social prescribing money that's also available to Huntington Primary Care Network. So we've got lots of lots of irons in the fire in terms of like new stuff and new activities that they can commission us to do, and and we we will. We might need some more resource to do that, but but it's you know it's it's something that we're working on. Uh, yeah, you're just going to lose me. Sort of what I was going to say, but that's okay. I think as you can see, Councillor Burke, there's an awful lot of work. I don't think we're going to get ahead. And if you were somebody who you know was in meetings with health today, it wouldn't be like you're missing. Sorry. There we go. Um, 
we're leading the way, basically. It wouldn't be remiss to say that Huntington's really leading the agenda in some of these areas. Um, I've got the managing director for North Place in my room tomorrow, and we are really redefining for them what good health looks like. So not waiting until someone's had the fall before they get interventions. How do we design our planning phase? So um, Joe's doing some great work, real commitment across the organization. I think you have some real confidence that we're, we're really banging on those doors at the moment. Just to add to that, um, we've already um, interacted with the local primary care network for Huntington, um, who are utilising five um, rooms within St Ives Leisure Centre. So during the day, they'll utilise the, the rooms for social prescribing appointments and also for um, health and fitness coaches to engage with our staff and their, their, their residents. But also in the evenings, they use the surge appointments for the nurses and doctors as well. And, and there is a clear commitment there to sort of create and um, develop that network across the leisure centres um, to create the health and wellbeing hubs as well. So that's actually actively happening at the moment. I, I just wanted to add as well that also we've got a newsletter that goes out to over 150 health professionals of different levels every month explaining what there is on our regular programme of activities. So again, we're getting more and more referrals or signposts into the existing like general courses and activities that we're doing as well from health colleagues and they're becoming much more aware of what is available and they're very grateful for that in Hunts. They don't have that same opportunity in many of the other districts. Thank you. Um, I, I think you probably wish I didn't ask that question, um, but it was really insightful. And I, I just wanted to, again, just reiterate my first comment, which was thank you, because actually it also highlights, and this is kind of going on on, on the comment, um, made a few minutes ago about how incredible the joined up working is um, and, and that's down to the work that you guys are doing and your team so I just wanted to reiterate my thanks. Councillor Albain. Thank you Chair, on a, on a similar point I've got loads of questions but let's start a nice easy one P picking up on that the, in the integrated thing there's a number of us here that do park run and and the, t the support that One Leisure gives to Huntingdon Park Run, to Pocket Park Run, is, I think is fantastic. How many local GP practices are recognised as Park Run practices and, and promote Park Run, do you know? You, I'll, I'll be honest, I don't know on that one. I, there's a couple. There's a couple. There's a um, one in St. Neas, obviously, um, that is very supportive of Park Run. But I, I couldn't tell you how many practices are actually park run supporters are if that I would need to go away and find find that out I'm afraid um but obviously we, we as a council we as a team we we helped set up the well we set up the St it's one in the first place and obviously the countryside staff support the Huntingdon one we did want to try and get a one in St Ives last year but unfortunately well, that was um prevented at the time by the previous administration because the choice of location was possibly not the best. So we're going to revisit that at some point as well. So it's not that we, you know, we do support part run um, and it is a real good opportunity for people. I think uh, Jo's underplaying her role in, in setting up Pocket because I know she's put a lot of work from what I understand in, in, into the background. But before I ask my next question, Councillor Taylor wanted to come in, Chair. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Auburn, for bringing up the part run because um, it is a very important um, activity. Um, although it's called Park Run, um, it's not purely for, for runners, it, it's for walkers. And anyone with a dog with a short lead can do it as well. So, you know, we really, really want to promote this for not just runners, you know, anyone can come along and we, you know, totally welcome anyone at the Pocket Park as the um, Huntingdon uh, Park Run as well. If you can walk, let's go. Let's go out there and do it. You don't have to be a runner. Thank you for bringing that up, Cancer Auburn. I'm an evangelist for park runner every any given opportunity. St Ives Outdoor Track, I remember that came up before. Could you have clarification on whether it's now in a position to host competitive events again and what, what the future is, please, for the, for the outdoor track? 
Okay, yeah, um, that's going to be sort of a key thing within the, the playing pitch strategy. So um, it has got UK Athletics track mark up until 2025. Um, so then within the strategy, it's got to be reviewed and looked at that um, there might be some resurfacing work needed on that track. But at the moment, um, UK Athletics acknowledge the struggles for athletics clubs and athletics tracks across the country. So they have lowered some of their criteria of what's required um we've also invested in the, the throwing area of uh, in the last six months i believe we've invested in there at the request of the club so that, that area the hammer throw and the javelin at the back of the track that's all been upgraded so that also meets now competition standard um so yeah it'll be one of the projects and one of the strategic recommendations within that playing pitch strategy when that's endorsed Comments or questions? Um, Councillor Well. Thank you very much, Chair. It's a lot of information to take in. Um, I just wonder whether those slides would be available prior to a site visit. If that's okay, cool. Um, great to see 589 new direct debits. Um, I should imagine that's quite normal for a post Christmas membership. I wonder how that will fall away. It's more an observation than a question. Um, the health condition classes, are they actually subsidised or do they have to pay full rates for that? And finally, you'll be pleased to know, um, one leisure, talking about competition, one leisure isn't just a fitness centre, it offers lots of other things as well. So do we or could we offer direct debit members discounts on things like squash and badminton and swimming and such like, or do we already do that? Thank you. Yeah, I'll take the, I'll take the first bit on the health condition classes. So on the specialist health condition classes, we run um, cardiac rehabilitation for people who've had a heart attack and have um, successfully undergone rehab at, at um, the local hospital and um, pulmonary maintenance, which is for people with obviously lung disease, chronic, chronic um, obstructive pulmonary disease or long COVID, such like that, and um, cancer as well, cancer and exercise for people either living with or, or post-cancer. Um, and then we also have ESCAPE, which is a nationally recognised pain management programme for people with arthritis. So they're, they're the sort of four health condition type classes. All of the active lifestyle class, regular classes are, are priced at £4.80, which is a lot less than a regular actual mainstream class that Paul would offer, whether it's, whether it's a falls prevention class, a chair-based class, or cardiac rehab. So basically, they're all, I suppose you could say technically they're supervised, but it's, um, sorry, um, subsidised because they're not at, the, not at the mainstream price, but actually they tend to more or less cover their costs, so certainly they did prior to COVID. We also have options for people to, if they qualify for concessionary membership, they can um, get them a bit cheaper as well. And also if there's an active lifestyles um, membership, which again is cheaper and now for people who come through our programs as a direct debit. So they pay £33.50 instead of £40, £40 a month. So there are options there. The difference one is cancer because Hunt's Community Cancer Network actually commission us to deliver those sessions. So anybody who attends the cancer classes gets it free of charge. So it's it's very um, very much depends on on the session and and who uh, and whether it's commissioned or not. But uh, but um, not non they're all they're all at a lower rate than what the, a, a mainstream normal class would be a regular class I shouldn't say normal. Thanks, Joe. Um, I'll take the, um, the questions we're, we're around memberships, um, if I can. You're absolutely right. This time of the year, we, we do see uh, a big influx uh, of members. Um, as Greg said, our, our target for our DD members was, was 500. Um, we, see a, we see an average of uh, just under 500, which is why we set that as a target. Targets have to be achievable. So, so to hit um, you know, the, the numbers that we had with direct debits plus our annuals, which took us well over 630, was, was, was good particularly considering the, the cost of living um, um, things going on at the moment. In terms of the, the membership question asked around um, can members get other things, um, we, we have a variety of memberships and one of our 
biggest promotions that we've got running at the moment is our platinum membership, which allows people access to, to the gym, to the swimming pools, to fitness classes. Um, they get um, off peak um, courts, which is daytime and all, all day at the weekends. So they can get courts uh, for squash and badminton. But as equally important, and we are making a big um, splash of this over our promotions at the moment, it's more more value than than a lot of our competitors because free swimming for for children um, of that platinum membership, and I don't know whether Greg's going to kick me under the table here on this one, but sort of hot off the press, what we're looking at at the moment is to expand that into a more family based type membership as well because we recognise that compared to our competitors who are just gyms or whatever, we can provide everything. So things like bowling and Leo's Fun Zone and stuff like that, how can we capture that in a, a membership that, that would be attractive to the local community? So that is an offer that we're looking to launch in the spring. Councillor Shaw. Thank you. Um, there's a lot of talk of direct debit memberships being up, which is brilliant news. Um, what about casual users, i.e. non-direct debit people? How are those figures fared? You, I couldn't see anything in the presentation. Yeah, um, our casual usage is, is static, uh, to, to be honest, as is our annual. And and the reasons, I don't have, I only have anecdotal reasons for those, but obviously annual is a, is a big upfront payment. Um, and, and with the current you know, situation with a lot of people's um, cost of living, um, I guess direct, that's one of the reasons maybe why direct debits is up because people prefer that um, as a solution to paying annually, even though the annual discount gives you a, a bigger discount than a, if you paid monthly for 12, 12 months. But uh, casually static because we, um, our, our price model is, is deliberately based around trying to give people value. So if you come on a, on a casual basis, you pay £7.50 for a session, um, which is quite expensive when for, for 40 pounds, you get a platinum membership, which is the all encompassing membership. That, so if you, you just do a simple math on that, if people come two or three times a week and they've got children that go swimming, you know, that's, that's exceptional value. So no, sta um, casual membership is, is, is very static, but it is probably, uh, I don't have the figures for you, but it's in the single percentage of, of our, our, our numbers. So um, we, we, we monitor it, but we don't focus on it too heavily. Councillor Orbain? I think, I mean, personally, I think um, a, a casual admission is, is something that would be good for people to give it a go. Um, and I think maybe with this is something we need to promote on, on that is because gyms can be quite scary um, when, when you're not used to them or if you want to go in and play badminton, it's quite a daunting experience sometimes. So I think with the casual um, ability where you can just go in, I think that's a real good opportunity for people to give it a go. And I think that's something we should, and thank you for bringing up, because I think that's something that we should look at to sort of promote people who are a bit nervous, um, that haven't actually gone into a gym before, um, give them that opportunity to go in. Whether we have anything like that now, I'm not entirely sure, but I think that's something we should look at. Um, thanks, Councillor Taylor. Uh, just to, to respond to that, um, it's something that we'll look at because we don't join that up with what we do do. And what we do do is um, on every Thursday, uh, the second Thursday of the month or whatever, you can bring a friend for free because of exactly the, the, the principle that you just talk about. So we recognise, you know, it's, a, it's an industry um, recognized um, that, that coming with somebody else removes those barriers. So we do promote that in terms of refer a friend. Um, there, there's a promotion around that. Bring a friend for free on that particular Thursday. But capturing that, um, you know, for our casual members, I don't, you know, um, casual members could bring a friend for free on that Thursday, but I don't think we necessarily promote that specifically. So it's something that we can look at for, for a future promotion for sure. Thank you, Chair. Just again, following on us for, from a similar, similar theme, I was surprised when the, the pop-up gym appeared up near the Tower Leisure Centre, a, a retail centre, and the, a, a shop had gone and a gym had gone in there. And then I was up at Serpentine Green at the weekend, and 
H and M, which is one of the, the bigger units up there, is now a gym. Which um, my son said, well, you "Didn't you know that?" Um, I, I'm intrigued to know locally, and also with the broader municipal sector, is is shops into gyms and this pay as you go, 24 hour gym thing. Is that is that a fad that might disappear like exercise classes come and go? Is that est is that estimated to be that? Is it how does that figure into our our thinking in terms of income projection and usage, and how does it figure in the amongst your colleagues in the wider municipal sector as to what kind of effect those kind of retail shop gyms are, are going to have on the, on the market and the provision? Thank you. Great question. Um, we know that the independent operators, such as the, uh, the pure gyms that I think you were alluding to, um, that are well. Uh, that will open imminently, uh, the similar to the gym groups um, in Huntington that have affected our business. We, we know that they're a growing trend and we know that it's something that we need to be aware of. But what I think Paul alluded to earlier is around the family offer and about what we can offer. They can't offer swimming pools. And I think whilst they'll be there and they'll be there in, in, in the distance in terms of uh, operating, they will continue to be there. And I think we need to be clever in how we market and promote our facilities to com to compete with them. We know that it's a very positive period at the moment to um, promote and sell our facilities and our memberships. We've seen that in January and we hope to see that in February and March. I think um, looking at research that was undertaken by UK Active, um, you can see with Pure Gym alone, they're now spreading into Europe. So that probably gives you a, a sign that the, the, the independent operator is there to stay. It's, it's changed the marketplace over the last five to 10 years. Um, so I don't think they're going away. I don't think it's a fad, but the, the, the turning in to 24 hour gyms, that's something that, that we have looked at and that we continue to monitor because we've got facilities that potentially could you be utilized to compensate and um, compete with them in the future. Sorry, I just wanted to add on to that Greg, as well is that um, Huntingdonshire has one of the largest uh, older pop people population in the in the county certainly and um, certainly one of the fastest growing um, and personally I think the, the budget gym isn't necessarily their market and that's that's something else as well as the family side of thing I think we can we can offer that that different solution um, 24 hour shopping hasn't really lasted has it a lot of the shops supermarkets that used to do 24 hour shopping have now reduced their hours and gone back to limited hours as well so We'll wait and see on that one, but I think we need to we need to go for the for the old guys. That's what we need to do. <laughs> on that, I, I'm intrigued as to I never thought retail rents, commercial rents, um, were I, th I, I would have thought that would have that made a gym prohibitive. Maybe maybe it won't. I'm intrigued the outgoings that, that a, a shop in a retail leisure centre. I, I'll quote Serpentine Green again. I know it's in Peterborough, but it affects. You know, Yaks, well, Peterborough is spreading ever westwards. It's encroaching. Anyway, that's another another story. But it, it has an impact on our our leisure offer. How does a commercial gym in a, in a former resident, a former retail unit, become commercially successful? I don't understand. I think it's around the negotiation that they'll have with the actual landlord of the the, the actual property. Um, so um, I think during COVID, I'm, I'm aware that um, a lot of the independent operators, where, whereby um, the, the charitable um, operators were able to negotiate deferments or uh, waivers of their management fees and, and rates, um, independent operators weren't able to do that, some of which are no longer with us. But, but the, the, the bigger players, such as the pure gyms and the gym groups, I believe we're able to negotiate commercial rates with them because they'd rather have the, the them open as commercial gyms than they would ha actually have their asset free and, and unused um, because they wouldn't be getting anything in the first place. So I think that the rates and the 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 the, um, the, the, the payments have been reduced, uh, but I couldn't corroborate that because I'm not fully aware. But I can only assume um, that I would negotiate a lower rate because I'd have, rather have someone in there or something in there than nothing at all. Sorry, that sort of figures that seems to make make sense. So, with, does that then give us a, an opportunity, with our ability of owning our own estate, to make plans that a commercial operator in a retail unit that might have initial discounted um, terms to get in to get in and set up won't won't have? Sorry. Uh, quite simply, yes. I think it provides us an opportunity for long-term planning. So I've alluded to long-term planning and operating models um, within the presentation. And I think 
over the next five to 10 years, uh, we've, we've significantly seen massive changes within the leisure industry. No one expected to have COVID and the, the disruption and the effect that that would have. And I think over the next five to 10 years, a lot of it will come out of the built facility strategy that Martin alluded to. Um, and it needs to be a key aim, a strategic aim of ours of how we um, sort of uh, manage and uh, change and adapt. But I think there are facilities that we've currently got that could be adapted to um, that type of business model. Um, if we needed to compete. Um, but I think the focus really needs about, to be about the, the older generation and, and the family group because there's a lot we offer that they, they don't. And what we're seeing at the moment is that people still want to join us and be a member of us because of the benefits of the swimming pool, the, the exercise classes um, and, and, and what we offer more widely to what the gym, um, the, the gym group and the pure gyms and the independent operators offer. And I think that we've got as a council uh, and as a local authority, uh, a lot more stability in the leisure industry, managing our own assets, as you um, state, th than they do, because they will have to continue to uh, operate in a volatile market. Um, and, and they have fairly succinct and short term business plans to operate to. So I think in the wider term, the longer term, I think things will change and will play into our hands. Councillor Hunt. Thank you very much for that presentation. Extremely useful. One Leisure is one of the jewels in our crown, thanks to your guys' work and the works of your team, and that truly shows. Um, uh, just a quick one for me, because I'm conscious from the time. Would you be able to give a bit uh, more info about the work One Leisure and Active Lifestyles does with younger people, please? Okay, yeah. Um, so young people is one of our focus areas. Um, we do work with schools, so we go in and have a few school contracts. Obviously, there is a lot of competition around there for schools and it links into our capacity to, to deliver the number of schools we have, but we do have certain ones that, that we work with. Um, we offer a under fives program across the leisure centers. So it's something that working with the one leisure, says, one leisure facilities in terms of daytime use, we do some under fives programs called mini movers. So that again, gets in young adults in terms of parents with their young children, um, gives them insight into what else can happen within, across the center. Um, in the community, we do work with parish councils. So we have a parish uh, council holiday programme. So it's quite successful and we're trying to grow that where the parish councils can come to us and commission us to deliver holiday programmes on their doorstep. So we go out and, and do that locally with them. Um, we do stuff with special educational needs schools, so disabilities as well with young people with disabilities. So for example, like I mentioned about the adaptive bikes, we, we have Spring Common as a special educational needs school come and come there to um, access them. So there's various things that we do with, with young people. And like I said, it's one of our sort of key areas that we look at. Thank you. Well reminded, uh, yeah, one of our, well, a good program that we run um, is our homeschooling offer. So uh, one of our delivery officers has a good connection with the homeschooling group. So we run um, a session in Huntingdon that's now doubling in size. Um, we have about to 50 children that's homeschooled that want to access that. So in terms of their provision for physical activity, they come in and, and utilize the sports hall. We do multi-sports with them. We deliver that also in, in Ramsey and we're looking to add that into St. Neitz as well in terms of that, that program. So that's another one that we do. Thank you very much. Thank you. Councillor Harvey. Thank you, Chair. Uh, one of your slides says that group exercise is underperforming. So I just wondered what measures you're taking to improve the situation? Yeah, thanks. Um, group exercise was it was one of the activities coming back from COVID that was that was really hit. Uh, and again, it's a it's a national trend. Um, you know, coming in together in a group. You think about COVID and, and the effects that has um, in an indoor environment is, is significantly. Um, you know, um, there's, there was worry there um, with regard to that. What we've got at the moment is we're running a, a focus group across all the sites. Um, and the focus group is not just uh, staff who look after the the, the, um, the group exercise program. It's receptionists who deal with the bookings. Um, it's people who take part in the in the program. Uh, and what we're doing is reviewing what we deliver, how we deliver it, what times, um, because what we're seeing is a little bit of a shift in that group exercise uh, demographic. A lot of people that I talked about who don't come back, who haven't come back after the pandemic, are traditionally 
um, you know, and this isn't stereotypically, this, this is a demographic that's measured, um, female, 30 to, to, to 45 people who have gone away and they've bought their Peloton bikes and they've done things like that. So the industry suggests that there is a shift because young people who, who generally um, go through into taking that, they're not as socially, um, you know, they don't want to go and, and socialize and group exercise together. So going back to Greg's point, can we make a digital focus on it? Can we, we believe that there's going to be a shift within the group exercise. So, so virtual platforms where people can maybe do it at home as well as in, in the center. It, it, it is, this focus group has got five specific themes that we're looking at, program, customer journey, digital innovation, um, the, the, the instructors who, who deliver it uh, to, 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 to try and, and make um, group exercise more uh, current, uh, you know, and, and attract the, 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 the people that, that will want to do it at the moment. So it's not an easy one, I'm going to be honest. Um, but we know, again, Greg's referred to it, that as part of our platinum membership program, it's a great reten with, with retention tool. You know, it's a social, people come and they want to exercise and do want to, but they want to be social, really. We just need to make them realize that, that that's part of it. So, you know, it, it is a key, key um, theme going forward. Can I? Thank you. Just, just really quickly, um, actually group exercise classes for older adults has shown a different trend and that for us has, has actually grown. So whilst the younger element is not recovering, the actual generally with us, it has. So we're getting 25 to 27 at Buckton regularly every week. We're getting 20 at Warboys every week. Um, you know, the, the classes in the community venues are doing particularly well um, as well. So it's not just about what's happening in one leisure and there is that offer available for people in their own settlements as well. So that's just a slight different in trend, but it, it's just worth noting, I think. If there's no other comments or questions, I just want to... Councillor Oh, Councillor Auburn again. Thank you. I'm conscious of time, Chair. So I've got a couple of more detailed questions regarding the slides, if we could have those back. And if they my necessitate a written answer because um i'd look at to look at the attendances slide that we had earlier on all right stuff thank you thank you very much are those figures um how can i put it Taken, I can't remember when, when Sawtree moved out of one leisure. So, was um, if that's included in those years, are those figures balanced out to in, to incorporate that? Um, also, what's the breakdown? And this probably might need to come in write, writing. And what's the breakdown between dry side um, swimming, outdoor, um, and the outdoor centre and Burgess and Burgess Hall? Because I, I think. It's good to see attendances are, are holding well, but obviously the the um, the financial expenditure needed on swimming is probably, if I got this right, is more is costs us more to run than a, than hiring out of Abington Court. So I think it'd be good if we can have a breakdown of sort of some more like for like figures, and if those figures do include Sawtree, whether they would be even better if they're sort of what's the word you know balanced out. You know what I know what I mean to account for the fact that Sawtree isn't in 21, 22, 20, 23, 24, but they may, it may have been in 17, 18. Thanks, Carter Alban. Um, unfortunately, I'm gonna to have to be honest, Sawtree was taken out of all of those figures so that we were comparing apples with apples. So, you know, those, those figures there exclude Sawtree in, 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 in all, all years so that we can look at it. Um, and uh, I listened intently to the, to the previous presentation when they were talking about spreadsheets. Um, I think the easiest thing for me to say is we have spreadsheets upon spreadsheets of admissions and I'll quite gladly share, you know, those which break down um, admissions across not just the swimming pool, but swimming lessons, general swimming, swimming clubs, um, and then all the different activities that, that, that take place. So we can, we can take you through those, no problem. That'd be great. And on a related thing, on the, the, the financial, the project, uh, profit and loss, the, def, the deficit we've referred to, I think there's a couple of slides on.
Uh, 26. Yeah, from there, I know you said some of this, some of the background behind the figures is commercially sensitive as what, of what's going on. It's just to seek reassurance through you, Chair, that at some point, formally as well as informally, we're going to be able to have a look at, at the figures and see how they're breaking down. Um, and I've got one last question, which Mr. France probably won't be surprised to know because I raise it every time one leisure comes and it's courts for kids. It picks up on something Councillor Hunt said about engaging young people. I know I keep going on about it, but the dropout rate of young people from, from organised sports. So what, what are we doing? And because I raised it last time that Courts for Kids was going to be promoted. And, and what, what have we done since last time One Leisure was here to promote it? Because we've got a fantastic offer. And I'm really keen that young people are reached, have the opportunity to know what, what's there on offer for them during the school holidays. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and, and as you say, uh, Councillor Alban, the, the Courts for Kids, the Courts for Kids is still there, definitely. Um, and it's still a, a promotion that we offer. Um, I've, I've got to be honest, we tend to focus on it in the in the winter months when, you know, the, um, the um, children come in and, and taking part in activities indoors. What we did last year, I don't know whether you noticed, is that rather than Courts for Kids in the, in the summer holidays, we promoted our pictures. So we, we took that... Um, um, principle of, of courts for kids and um, groups of it doesn't matter how many children can come and hire a quarter of the synthetic pitch for five pounds um, so we've taken that principle into the um, the pitch hire as well so you, you may see you know a combination of, of those um, a lot of it as, as we talked about before and I don't I, I don't profess to be a marketing expert but but goes out on social media sort of targeted on Facebook groups and, and, and stuff like that um, but um, you know we can we can certainly look at that and, and talk about that. It, it's certainly a, a key activity for us because, being honest, we don't. Martin's talked about the junior program that Active Lifestyles deliver throughout the leisure centres, but we don't have quite as many organised activities that one leisure deliver for juniors. Courts for Kids is one. We tend to work with partners such as the Football Fun Factory and, and that that come in and, and deliver junior activities in, in the centres in the holidays. It was, it's more about the promotion. I looked through the, hunting, the Huntingdon One Leisure Facebook feed and there didn't appear to be anything to promote it. And whilst um, Instagram may be more for the, for the kids, the Facebook is, is my generation and I mean, my, my youngest is, is beyond that group now. But when he, when he was, him and his mates, it was a, as you said, it was a good thing to do. A load of them, dads and lads, got together and we went up to sort you and it was part of one, one Leisure. And it's a great thing to do. So if we're not promoting on, on Facebook, we're, we're missing the opportunity to reach probably the, the parents that are paying the, paying the money. So it's a, um, a great scheme. And I think other than if we got that reassurance about look, being able to look at the figures again and the commercially sensitive stuff as it, as it comes through, yeah. that's... Um, that, re that is it for me for questions. Thank you. I'm a, yes, that's obviously coming through the democratic cycle, so that will be coming through. Closed session. Yeah. Thank you. The comments or questions? No. I want to thank you. Oh, uh, Councillor Taylor. Um, yeah, I just wanted to say, and I know you're going to say it as well, Councillor Kerr, but I just want to say a really big thank you to the team. Um, thank you, Martin, Greg, Paul and Joe. Um, that was a brilliant presentation and I did tell you there's a lot of information in there. Um, and, and I know Councillor Welton has asked if they can be provided to the um, overview and scrutiny here tonight, but through you, Chair, if Becky could put them out to the whole members, I'd really appreciate that. We can do that in the member alert as well as sending directly to the two panels if you'd like that. So that's, yep. is that coming through? Yes, so we can we can send that out via the member alert on a, yep, on a weekly basis as well as to the two panels. That's Starts brilliant. Being mentioned in both panels. Thank you. Yes, I did want to thank you, but equally, 
I'm really excited by the pioneering work I've heard about today. It is so exciting what we're doing in Huntingdonshire. Thank you. So we'll just move on now to item six, the working program. Has everyone had a chance to look at it? Has anyone got any comments or discussions about it? I just have a brief update to give on, on the uh, status of the items. Um, so the review of external appointments to outside bodies uh, working group, that report went to the panel last night and that will be going to cabinet next week. Um, that will stay on the programme as a regular review item so that that can just be um, it's just kept on top of there. Um, and then just a quick brief update on the climate strategy group, which has um, occurred since this uh, was published. The Following the climate um, strategy, which came through last month, we had a meeting of the climate working group with the executive council and officers. Um, and the climate working group is going to be looking at um, the electrical vehicle charging strategy that's coming through. So they'll be greatly involved in that as well. So just to update on that. And then obviously we've got quite a few of the other items on there that are more information items which we have planned in for the coming months. Um, so obviously I'll keep you updated as, as they're coming through as well. So is there any other questions apart from that? Or? In that case, we'll close the meeting. Thank you so much for your attendance and your contributions.